And they can probably hear. There we go. So I'm with Dan I'm at Geo Solutions. We're a seismic processing company. Uh, we're headquartered here in Perth. Uh, well, I've got a few marketing slides, which we were the same as, hang on, same as last year. Um, we've got four main offices, Perth, Kuala Lumpur, Houston, London. We do projects all over the world. Moving right along, here we go. Um, we're a oil and gas, seismic processing, um, a whole heap of stuff there which you may or may not be interested. I know someone here from Woodside is probably interested, but they already know what we do anyway. Um, but we process data for oil and gas companies. That's sort of what we do. They give us vast amounts of data on tape. We crunch it and give it back to them on tape. Okay, so this talk. Um, I thought I'd tackle a few things. Uh, anyone who's sort of seen our facility up in West Perth knows that we're the oil immersion people. Um, and I thought I'd talk about a little bit about data centres. Uh, why is power usage going up? How much power is being used? Why, why do we target cooling as a, as a place to save power? And, uh, and then some of the solutions in the extreme data centre cooling. And then uh, the last bit, sort of, I think, the interesting part, this advantage is yet to be realised. There's a whole heap of stuff which happens in the advanced cooling space, which I don't think vendors are yet taking advantage of. And uh, we'll sort of highlight a few of those. So why is power going up? especially given that all vendors are focusing on reducing power. Your laptop battery lasts longer, your phone battery lasts longer, your watch lasts longer, and yet, fires and volters are using 250 watts a socket, and that's going up, not down. So what the hell's going on? You look at these things, Volta 12 nanometer process, they're putting 21 billion transistors on a die using 250 watts. Intel, 14 nanometer technology, 8 billion transistors. Um, they've still got 13 billion transistors, they, I assume they could turn on. So with their 8 billion, they're using 250 watts a socket. Um, so they could notionally do 500 if you could cool it, I suspect. Don't know that for sure, I'm just surmising, just looking at their products. So as I said, they're going up. And yet everything else in the IT industry is using less power. So I think this will be a trend that goes on for a little bit, and that's one explanation of um, why we're using more power. Does it change? So just think about that. 250 watts a socket at 1.2 volts. You're doing 200 amps across those little pins sticking up on the motherboard. 200 amps. Think about that. <laughs> No, really, think about that. It's a lot of power. A die this big. The wafer's even smaller inside, 200 amps. It's quite incredible. Doing that level of power or that current on a circuit board with ultra-thin wafers is, is, in my mind, slightly insane. I was going to bring a piece of 32-amp cable from our data centre and show you what that looks like. I have a bit of, you know, your standard cable, your kettle plug to plug in your computer, 10 amps. So you've got 20 times that thickness, so to speak, in that CPU. It is insane. And as I said, it's going to go up. Those voltages are going to come down and the current is going to go up. But there are other things going on. Power used by memory is becoming quite considerable. 10 watts a dim. Every chip now is doing more memory channels. You know, you're looking at four memory channels per socket or six memory channels per socket. So you're going to have four dims or six dims, and at 10 watts, that starts adding up. Current systems, you might have eight, 10 dims in them. So you're doing 80, 100 watts just in the memory. And unfortunately, most memory can't downclock in speed. It's 1600, 1666 megahertz. Every clock cycle, you have to refresh the, the bits in the DRAM. So it doesn't really drop in memory. So even though your CPUs might get a bit better, your mem cost of memory power is going up. And at the moment, memory is also quite a dominant cost, unfortunately. But we're also doing more. So we've got 250 watts, but we're also getting 6, 12 teraflops out of it. So we're getting an awful lot of compute. And we're doing more with it. We're doing artificial intelligence or extracting more information to exploit, modeling rather than experimenting. We're tracking people. We're tracking things. 
you know, all these barcode scanners and devices you wave around. We're doing higher precision modelling. We're doing cryptocurrency. Uh, all of these things are consuming vast quantities of power. As I said, uh, if only the cryptocurrency, the algorithm you solved helped cure cancer, it would be much better, but here we are. But the other interesting thing is if you look at some of these... Um, does this actually work? Nope. Here we go. Some of these things, these tracking people and that, the more data we get, the more data we crunch. And quite often that means going back and re-crunching the old data with the new data you've acquired. So we are doing a lot more compute than we ever used to do. And that's why we're using more power. I'll talk a little bit about the seismic industry. Um, we're doing new computational algorithms. Oil's getting harder to find. Um, we're doing things shallow ward to multiple, high frequency full waveform inversion, elastic full waveform inversion. These are just words probably to most of you. The important thing is to realise is that even like if we just take full waveform inversion and we double the frequency we're going to model, that implies roughly a 10x increase in compute. Currently most machines, companies and all the rest are looking 15 hertz solutions. And they want to push it out to 125, so that's a factor of 100. So, you know, Doug, where I come from, we currently have 25 petaflops. You know, here comes the 2.5 exaflop machine we need to get up to the frequencies I think that a lot of people would like to, you know, the industry would love to do. So again, you know, we're doing much higher resolution solutions, crunching a lot more data. Why? Because we can. We've got the compute. I will just drop in here that we've all been here before. So yes, we are using lots of power, but it's all relative. In the 80s, Cray did fluid cooling. Cray made its name based on the fact that you know, their first machines were all about packing transistors and chips into high density packaging and being able to cool it. All through history, Cray's been an innovator in the cooling space. Okay, it's a little bit of a shame to see them doing clusters, but here we are. So how much power is actually being used? So we're seeing you know, your power usage go up, my power usage going up. How much is being used? A fuckload. That has increased today to more than 3% of the world's energy, 420 terawatts. And data centres are responsible for 2% of total greenhouse emissions. That was a 2017 number. Imagine what that's going to be like in 2021 when the Internet of Things has got more stuff connected and we're processing even more data, when the uh, exaflop machine comes along from Cray, uh, this is exploding. That's more power than the entire United Kingdom. More power than, what is it, 90 million people? It's a lot of power. That's how much is being used worldwide. So what do the cooling solutions look like? This is leading into my next slide. Data centre cooling. Most data centres, commercial data centres are here. They blow a fair amount. They almost double their power usage just on cooling. That's how inefficient they are on, on power transformation, inefficiencies of cooling, moving air around, low power racks. Um, that's sort of where they are. High efficiency data centres, this is probably, I'm guessing, from my own experience where a lot of universities sit. Now they have high performance computing data centres. Still we're there, still cooling in traditional ways. If they do something sexy, they might be down here, like use highly efficient coolers. Maybe evaporative, maybe free cooling if they can. A lot of places can't. Um, the cooling solution which we've employed, we ran over summer at one point, a PUE of 1.04. So we wasted 4% of our budget into the data centre on cooling and other things, not, not compute. So there's a long way from where most data centres are today to where you can get to if you really want to. So this is, um, think about that in terms of 420 terawatts. Was it 420 terawatts? Yeah, 420 terawatts. You could almost halve that 
just by clever data centre design. Why target cooling? The physicist in me says, well, there's not much else you can actually target. CPUs are out of your hand. All of the memory, you know, design and power designs out of your hands. The only thing left that you as a facility can really do is probably optimise on the data centre. You know, you might be able to choose a 95 watt CPU versus a 110 watt CPU if the 95 watt CPU does the job for you. Or you might be able to choose a slightly lower powered Volta or, you know, whatever, pay a bit more, get the lower voltage version of the same chip so it uses less power but does the same amount of compute. But fundamentally, there's not a lot you can play with. But the cooling you can. And it's in all of your power to do that. So, a quick tour of the extreme data centre cooling out there. What are we doing it for? Well, we want to get more flop for less energy. We want to increase our density. And more importantly, I think this will become important and we want to reduce waste. And that's not necessarily just packaging waste. Wasted energy, a whole heap of things. We just want to stop throwing stuff away. People are doing bizarre things, let me just say. A very prominent company <laughs> decides that in order to change a disk, this is what you need to look like. They are putting data centres on the bottom of the ocean. I'm not quite sure why. I haven't really dug into this in great detail to understand the thermodynamics of the system. But it is interesting that this is even considered. That's how big a problem it's becoming. The obvious things, people are putting data centres in cold places. Okay? Try and use the cooling of your atmosphere to do that. I believe this is an artist's impression of a data centre for Facebook in Sweden somewhere. I don't know, Google just showed it to me so I put it in. Then comes all of the more direct stuff you can do. This is uh, direct attached cooling, liquid cooling, so you're pumping the fluid straight in over the top of the CPU and warm water in, maybe cold water in, or sometimes some people are using an oil, pumping it into and swirling it around top of the CPU and then taking warm water out. Direct liquid cooling. Notice with this direct liquid cooling, you aren't cooling these things. These things. In this solution, you're not cooling the dims. There are solutions which do cool the dims. But as pointed out in my first, well, in the early slides, these things are starting to contribute a reasonable amount to your energy budget. And in this solution, they're not being cooled by the efficient cooling solution. So, something to consider. Some of the solutions which try to get around this, I think this one, I don't know, could be HP or SGI, I don't know. I just stole it again off Google. This is a, a cold plate. So they have a a plate which sits on top and, and is supposed to sort of surround all the components and the energy is put into a gel or an oil or something and then taken off so you don't again have CPUs and fans or you don't have fans and you don't cool it with air. This, whoop, I'm gonna, this here is a cold pad so this is sort of like a gel filled pad that you sit on top. Um, again, similar sort of principle. You're trying to cool all the components on the motherboard, take the energy out through a far more efficient method than air. Then you get to what I think are, are the, the, inter the, from a physics point of view, the, the sexiest cooling in the industry. This is the two phase people. So they, they are boiling a fluid off the CPU and off any warm component. So this fluid has a boiling point of about 65 degrees and as the components get up they convert it to a gas and then the gas rises and then above you grab that gas and recondense it back down to a fluid. Um, this from a physics point of view is very very sexy. From a practicality point of view wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. 
lots of lots of lots of issues with this type of cooling, and they're probably all solvable, but they haven't been solved yet. Um, this has been done by lots of people. So this one's here, I believe, is the sort of 3M products, Fluorinert and oh, what's their other product? Anyway, one of theirs. Pardon? Novak. Novak. Um, these have been wheeled around every vendor for about the last 10 years at supercomputing, but every one to two years they change vendors. Read into that what you like. Um, this one here, I believe, is Hitachi. No, Fujitsu, sorry. Uh, sort of a cubular system you can stack up. Um, and then this one was just another one that I found on the... Oh, here we go, Allied Controls. I don't know. Anyway, two-phase. Boiling the fluid off, recapturing the, the condensation, recondensing it back down and putting it back in the tub. Yep. Pardon? Um, lots of problems with this solution actually. So when I, I've got a, a, the, the engineer we use to help design our data centers is a building and fire engineer. So he designs the you know sprinkler systems and data room fire suppression systems as well as electrical and he's a complete mechanical engineer. And when he learned that 3M was using Novak, he said, oh don't they have problems with moisture? Oh, what do you mean? He goes, well, Novak becomes quite acidic when it absorbs moisture. And then when you start asking around, there's a little bit of a problem with acidic, acidic fluids and the epoxy on motherboards. They can start to delaminate. And I mean, that was just straight off the bat because Novak's used as a fire suppression system. And so he said, well, that, you know, that's one of the problems they have is they've got to be a little careful how they use it because it, when it absorbs fluid. And then you start talking to these guys Sorry. And they start saying, oh yeah, we, we get rid of the fluid because we warm, we warm it up again. <laughs> so they have a whole heating loop sitting off to the side to heat the fluid up to get the water out and then recondense back down this, this fluid. Now, so sorry, they, they heat it up, take this off, the water's left behind, get rid of the water, recondense it a second time. So there's all of these sort of stuff you have to do. Aren't those usually in sealed containers though? They have to be in sealed containers, otherwise it disappears. And that raises another interest. It the moisture out as well. Pardon? Well, it can do. The problem is if you open it, it can start absorbing moisture. We have, this is a problem for a lot of the liquid cooling systems. And there's another problem with them as well, exactly for what you just pointed out. When you seal them, they can, in terms of city councils, become explosive. Not that they're going to be a fireball, but they might just go pop and shoot the lid off. All right? It cause that kind of overpressure. Well, that's right. So you have to start. What would cause that? Well, I assume if you just got really hot, you stopped your condenser unit stopped, and you just converted all the fluid to gas. Well, and so you would hit a, you would hope that you'd hit a pressure where it would recondense back out, right? Or it would come to an equilibrium. But that just seems really easily solvable. Oh, absolutely. These are all solvable. But try and explain that to a city councillor. Because remember, when you build your data centre of this stuff, you're going to have, say in my case, 70,000 litres of the product on site. And, you're, and in our case, we're in an office, not in an industrial park. So you have all these sort of fire codes and everything that you have to adhere to. So it becomes quite an interesting process. Everything is solvable. Absolutely. But sometimes, you know, is it worth the effort? And in terms of big data centres, absolutely. You might still save you a million, two million dollars a year in power. So it may well be worth it. But again, it's just considerations. Then you come to us. This is my data centre here. We're the one phase people. Okay, it's been around a while. Here's a fish tank. Someone running their latest fancy GPU in a fish tank because they don't want the noisy fans in there. I assume university dormitory room. Um, you have us, you know, again racking them up. You have a few other people around who are doing this type of cooling. Small number of systems. Um, again, what's our experience with doing this cooling? Why do we do it? Most of you have seen our facility up the road. If you haven't, come and see me. I can take you through. Oh yeah, another just a photo of our system. Did I push the wrong button? 
Here we go. I'll get on to our things at the moment, but let's just talk about what's this really all about. This is, this is a thermodynamics problem, a physics problem. And what we're trying to do in order to get the most efficiency, the efficiency gains of nearly all of these solutions, whether it be cold plate, direct attached fluid, single phase or dual phase, two phase systems, it's all about trying to get the equipment outside, the plant equipment at as high a temperature as possible. Okay? With our single phase solution, we provide 30 degree water. That's the input cool solution, 30 degrees. So that means it's actually quite simple to get the return water, which is coming out at, say, 38 degrees, down to 30. It's very hard to get, say, 50 degree air coming out the back of your standard server down to, say, 18 degrees, which is what you want going back in the front. You can flip over to completely different cooling solutions. You can go from a refrigerator system, which thermodynamically is going to blow 30% of your power budget just on shifting the energy. You can go to an evaporative system. And yes, you burn a lot of water. But the water's cheap. Okay, we go through in our data centre up the road here maybe $3,000 worth of water a month at 20 cents a kilolitre. So you go through a lot of water, but it's nothing compared to the power savings you have from not doing refrigerative. Uh, uh, evaporating off most of that water? Yep. Okay. It's all evaporating off. Can you recover any of that energy from the same water? You might be able to, but it, it starts becoming very marginal. I mean, we're only blowing 4%. Of, our, of the energy that comes into this data centre, only 4% gets diverted away from the computers. So you, if you halve it, you're down to 2%. I mean, it, it's, it's becoming very marginal at this point to whether it's worth doing a lot more. But again, it's, it's really, there, there are only a few things at, at play here. Try and get your input temperature up. Don't use air as a transport medium. It's terrible. Okay. You'd love to use water as the transport medium, but there's a little bit of a problem there. Try to have as few delta T's as possible. So every heat exchanger has a delta T. So you have the delta T from your computer, which has got the CPU running at, say, 80 degrees. Air coming in at 18, going out at 50. There's one delta T. Okay, then you've got the air cooler on the wall or the crack unit sitting on the floor or whatever it is. That's taking in 50 degree air and putting out 18 degree air. There's a delta T. That crack unit probably has a, a water loop attached to it, taking it outside to an evaporative system. There's another delta T outside. So there's all these delta T's. So you want to try and reduce those to get as efficient as possible. And obviously, if you go back to the direct attached cooling slide, One more. No, 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 no. You want to cool everything. These things are starting to add up in their heat. You need to cool them with your advanced solution. So I would recommend going for a solution which does that, and two phase, single phase, the cold plates and all those sort of do that. Um, what else could you do? Voltage transformation is another place where you lose a lot of power. Each voltage transformation, depending on what you're doing, could take up to 3% of your power. In Australia, we're quite lucky. So the, generally, um, the power you get from the utility is the power you use. So from the utility, you tend to get 415 volt three-phase power, 240 volts per phase. In the US, that is not what you get. In the US, you might get 277 volts, that's 110 per phase. You might get 480, which is what 270 per phase. And then you have transformers inside your facility to knock it down to whatever voltage you want. The data centre we're just building in the US right now is doing something a little different to most other US data centres, and that is we are taking high voltage and transforming it to 240 volts. So we are skipping intermediate transform transformers, again, to save energy. We are getting a high voltage meter from the utility, which again is quite odd, but it is cheaper power. It is cheaper if you take high voltage than it is if you take medium voltage. So we are taking high voltage, again reducing our costs. And surprisingly, if you look on the back of your power supplies coming out of your servers, 
they are more efficient at 240 volts than they are at 110 volts. At 240 volts, they're like 99% efficient, so you blow a percent in your power supply. At 110, they can be down to like 95. So straight away, you've lost 5% on your power supply. Now, interestingly, that 5% does not count in your PUE number because PUE is sort of to the plug in the back of your computer. So that 5% is used by the computer. But I'm a company. I still pay for the power. So now I'm still paying for that 5% that I'm not turning into number crunching. So we definitely want to do it. So the rule is less transformation. What's our experience? We save 43% of our total power bill by doing advanced cooling. And when we're running multiple megawatts, building, we're currently building a 13.5 megawatt facility, that matters. That's a huge saving in power, saving half your power bill. Knocking that 420 terawatts down to 210. Maybe less than the UK. Lots of other benefits, but it's power. Quick, uh, quick question. Do you have redundant pumps? Um, yes. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> some are, some aren't. <laughs> the ones that circulate water are redundant. So, the real part of what I want to talk about, what's yet to come? Well, space saving. You don't have fans, say, with our single phase solution. So you could put more compute in that space. If you get, as we have, the Intel KNL, so the Knight's Landing, the chassis, half of it is empty space for other things, fans and cables and all that, which we just take out. So we could run a lot more density. Density is floor space. Density is walls, carpet, all these things. Again, we can save all those things on the build if we can go to more, you know, better density. Simplification. Our two-phase solution, our single-phase solution, sorry, is a very, 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 very simple solution. It doesn't require massive fans and it doesn't require management of airflow and all of these sorts of things. Increased performance of components. Now, this is a fascinating one. So, we have 1.3 gigahertz Intel Xeon 5s. Because we can call them, they sit pegged at 1.6 gigahertz. 0.3 gigahertz for free. Longer lifespan, you don't get oxidation of joints. So, components actually last longer, and you may be able to translate that into different motherboard and socket designs to take advantage of that. The fact there's no oxygen getting in. Increased reliability, we find most components don't fail because you're keeping everything cool. So there's no hot spots on your motherboard. Again, that can be optimised, I think, a lot more to give you even more reliability. A lot of the things they do with your systems, you know, the shrouds and trying to control where the air goes and all that, can all just come out and be thrown away and that space used for other things. Um, reduction in materials. Again, we take the fans out. We take all the plastic shrouds out. We take all the crap that might block oil out. And so there's a whole heap of physical materials you could save. But there are other things. With a density saving, with this thing here, where is it? Where did I say density saving? Oh, space saving. Here we go. It might mean less copper cable for your power cables. Again, these, these things all add up to reducing the cost of building your data centre. Less power cables, less distribution boards on the wall, less space taken up with all of these things. Again, simplification of design and manufacture. Because we don't need all these shrouds and bits of plastic and stuff to control airflow, you can do away with them. You should be able to build a really simple motherboard with a really, really simple heat sink. The heat sinks that are in them are designed for air. They're not designed for fluid. So they've probably got way too many vertical fins on them to actually cool the CPU. So there's a whole heap of optimizations, I think, which will make these solutions even better. How am I going on time? Way over. Good. I'm all right. All right, so this is my last slide anyway. So what can you do about it? Well, I would say get started. Purchase a system that has advanced cooling of some sort. This is Seymour Cray. 
something or rather, yourself in a chronically leaking boat. Energy devoted to changing the vessel is likely to be more productive than energy devoted to patching the leaks. Stop using air. Stop trying to make air work. Stop trying all of these things to make air function. You know, the people are going to extreme things. They're putting fans on the backs of their racks. They're trying to control the air movement through their data centers. They're having huge amounts of pressure under the floor to distribute the air properly. The data center we're just building, we're actually having problems getting the air from one side of the room to the other because it's 50 meters. Right? You can't just put all your cracks on one end to keep the air cool for your switches and stuff. You actually then have to have fabric duct over the ceiling to try and get the air to where, you know, evenly spread throughout the room. Just don't bother with any of it. Do away with it. And I would say go fluid of some sort. Go much more advanced cooling. You'll save power. You should have very simple designs for your data centers. Um, they work wonderfully well. And uh, you'll start to push the vendors in the right direction. Because that's really all it needs now is massive vendor support. Thank you. Any questions? Yep. Other than removing that this airflow bits that you mentioned, do you make any other changes to the lumber floors themselves to make them compatible with oil or do you just not with the oil? Ah, we take the thermal paste off, the CPU. That's it. Do you? Mark, we sorry, I, I, I lie a little bit. Um, we also have to get the power supplies firmware changed because the power supplies have fans in them and you're going to turn it off and most power supplies detect the taco on the fan and will not function if the fan's not functioning. So we need to get the firmware changed to function when the fan's not functioning. That's it. And we do all that ourselves. Did, did you imply that you put, that you do have uh, heat sinks? Yes. So you have heat sinks on the CPUs. You still need a heat sink. Though. You still need, with, with a single phase solution, you still need a heat spreader of some form. But the ones we have are over-engineered for the job. Custom no, no, they're just the standard ones for air. Okay. But things which would work better for fluid is actually a greater spacing between the fins and a cheaper product like just aluminium rather than copper and stuff like that. So I think you can make some real savings on the products you use there and the amount of product. Up the back. Uh, so you talked about your overall power saving. I'm just wondering if you have numbers or um, uh, anecdotes about the overall cost savings. Uh, insulation cost is probably about half what you would do for air because the tubs are dirt cheap to make. They're cheaper than a rack. So we have the old SGI air cooled racks, you know, the ones with the big heat exchange in the back and fluid coming out the bottom. These tubs filled with fluid are half that price. You don't have you have evaporative systems which are dirt cheap. You do not have compressor based systems which are expensive. So it's actually about half the price. So you're going to save money on your build. Uh, and maintenance? Um, um, you oh, you, we have a crane, you pull it out, we have a drip tray. You sit the drip tray on top of the tanks, put the crane, put the node on it and just work straight on it and then put it back in the fluid. Our K and L nodes are actually that you don't pull the chassis out, they're just sleds that you pull out by hand. So you just reach in, grab a sled, pull it out, work on it, put it back. But components fail less. And does Intel support it? Yes. <laughs> they will. <laughs> uh, we, we, we have a fantastic relationship with Intel, and they are very good to us. And fundamentally, now that they have, have an understanding of the failure rates, they're, they're actually very comfortable with it. Kind of a magic fluid you uh, th this is a polyalpha olefin. It's a standard base stock oil. It's used for eye drops. Johnson's baby oil is mostly this fluid. Mobile One engine oil is this fluid. It is used, it's a food grade lubricant. You can ingest it. I have drunk a cup of it. <laughs> so far it's alright. Maybe later tonight we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when your oil boils? Um, so this oil has got a very high boiling point. Uh, it's, the, the, it's like 230 degrees or something. Um, so hopefully the CPU never ever gets there because the CPU will be well cooked before then. Um, most of the components are gone way before this oil will go. 
I sat there with a crucible and a gas torch trying to get it to flash over and I couldn't. <laughs> it's, it's incredibly stable. Is it flammable? I mean, everything's flammable at a certain temperature. Um, this burns, like, as I said, I, with a gas torch, four or five hundred degrees, I couldn't get it to burn. But notionally, it's got a burning point of 280 degrees where it supposedly can flash. Um, I'm, right. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I, I just downloaded that off the internet. Just in case you do the same No, I wasn't planning on using the talking. Oh, sorry. Um, I just downloaded, I just, see, I knew he'd made some of these comments. I went, oh, I'll see more Cray quotes, and then there wasn't any. That'll do. <laughs> yeah. Stuart, you're a proof point for this. Why aren't the hyperscalers doing it? Um, some are. Are they? So there are quite a few of the, well, I mean, I don't quite know what you mean by hyperscaler. Um, there are some cloud people looking at doing this stuff. Uh, that they are running active programs and to buy people's technologies like this and to roll this out in their data centers. A lot of miners are already doing this. Uh, it's very common in the mining space. So it's not as uncommon as you might think. That's a big proof point for Novak. In fact, one of the miners was one of their first big yep. reference accounts. It'd be fascinating to know how they're going a couple of years later. But they probably turn their hardware over faster than that anyway, so it wouldn't matter. They don't care about it. Yeah. <laughs> no. uh, did you renovate your unfaithful data center or just a new location? Um, the photos in there were from our Perth data center up here in West Perth. Um, that's got 44 tanks. We're currently building a big facility that'll hold about 700. So, no, Texas. Cheap power. Four cents a kilowatt hour versus 14. Well, we have a massive office in Texas. <laughs> we just, I mean, it's on tape. <laughs> so, no. I mean, we will have, still have a data centre here. We'll still have a data centre in all our offices. Mm -hmm. Another question? Thank you.